Okay, we are super excited to move on to our next section, which is a panel of discussion with creators. Uh, I really hope you have joined, enjoyed the workshop as much as we have. And uh, let's wrap up the workshop with a really interesting and exciting discussion. We have a podcast creator panel. We have a really set of diverse type of creators. We have uh, some uh, great science uh, podcast uh, creators. We have Farsi podcast creators and everyone. Um, so um, we thank Ni. Uh, she is a senior user researcher from Spotify who, will, who has accepted our invitation to um, moderate this panel. So I would like to just uh, give it out to uh, me to start the discussion and hope uh, we'll learn as researchers, as engineers, what we've been working on podcast recommendations. Uh, creators are a really important part of this ecosystem and it's really good to learn from them directly what's, what's, what's it, what is it that they care about and how can we take that into account uh, in our work. So Ni, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Zara. Hi everyone, my name is Ni, and like Zara said, I am working um, with a lot of the panel here, or sorry, a lot of the organizers here at Spotify uh, in the personalization mission. Um, so just to start, we would just love to uh, start a discussion with our podcast producers here on the panel. Um, so just to check, Zara, I think right now you're the main video on our screen. Is there a way to maybe show Ali and Josh? Uh, that's a good question. Let me see. So you see my video, even though it was uh, turned off. Uh, yes. So you like the okay. main kind of feature speaker. Um, so see. if there's a way for us to feature Josh <laughs> and Ali, that would be if great. you invite them to to speak, I think they may pop up. Oh, okay. Them. Great. Got it. Uh, perfect. Uh, so hi, Josh and Alice. I know it's our first time meeting, uh, but let's just jump into the panel. I know you're probably familiar with um, speaking to an audience. I, I'm not worried at all here. Um, okay, so thanks everyone for coming in today. Uh, if you would like, feel free to put in your questions in the chat throughout um, our discussion. And I will have a certain pause within our discussion for um, our panel here to take questions. Uh, Wendy um, and Patrick uh, couldn't make the time uh, with us today, but they have graciously agreed to uh, have a brief panel interview that I will also uh, show everyone later. And we'll hope to get Ali and Josh kind of thoughts and reactions on that, and as well as share their own answers. Um, all righty. Okay, so to kick things off, um, Ali and Josh, could you please introduce yourselves and share what your role is within the podcast space? Uh, how about we start with Ali? Yeah, sure. Hey. Uh, um, name is uh, Ali Bandari. Uh, I've been here and been going on one of panel B, the other one is box. So in both of them, essentially what I do is that uh, I talk about what I do, what I read, the box, the I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I think your sound is a bit muffled. Is it just me or does everyone also? Yeah, I also can hear Ali well. Yes. Maybe you can start with Josh and see what I do. Sure. Yeah. Josh, would you mind introduce yourselves and just share with us what your role is within the podcast space? Uh, certainly. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Richmond. I'm a uh, producer uh, for Stitcher um, and uh, specifically for their, uh, for their comedy network, Earwolf. I've been there uh, about six and a half years, uh, produced a, a lot of different shows. Uh, you may know shows like Unspooled, Freedom, Raised by TV. I've worked on shows like uh, Hello from the Magic Tavern, How Did This Get Made in some capacity, currently doing some work on uh, uh, Seth Rogen's upcoming show called Storytime with Seth Rogen. Uh, do a lot, I do a lot of work in particular on a Stitcher Premium and a paywall content, which has become a little bit of a specialty for me, but I'm a little bit of a, a jack of all trades around, uh, around Earwolf. That's awesome, thank you for sharing that. Um, 
So I can't help but ask, because it sounds like you work on both podcast and TV show. Is there any key difference between the two media that you want to share with us? Or oh, they... oh, sorry. I, I didn't mean to give the impression I work on a TV show. Uh, oh, no. sorry. Yeah, it's uh, I've, uh, I'm, I'm an audio only guy, specifically uh, everything I, I, you know, I used to work actually at Sirius XM uh, on, on the radio, uh, oh. on talk radio back before, uh, back before uh, they bought Stitcher. So it's a little bit of a full circle for me. But, um, but yeah, I've been, I've been in the audio space exclusively for the last 15 years or so. Awesome. So actually, you know what's funny? I'm a user researcher. So when we decided to change the, the term podcast to show uh, in Spotify, many of our users also got, because we also have video podcasts now. So the right. line between podcast, audio and video and everything has been very blurred now. So I'm, I'm feeling that uh, first and experience as, as our user right now. Um, it is, it's absolutely getting uh, blurrier by the day. Uh, what, is, what is video? What is audio? Especially as, as more podcasters are incorporating video. Right. Yeah. And especially with big names like Seth Rogen stepping into the auto space. Um, so is there any like interesting difference when you kind of transition from the radio format within Sirius FM into the uh, podcast? I guess it's more like time delay on demand type of audio. Oh, definitely. I mean, the most obvious is is yeah, the fact that you're you're create you're you're crafting something you know in a in in your own private space and then and then working on it in post as opposed to something that's really going on the air directly. Which uh, you know the 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 emergence of things like like Clubhouse and Green Room are kind of an interesting tote back to the live radio world I came from, and it's it's very cool to see things like that taking off. Um, another major difference is that radio. You know there are there are some indicators of ratings. You know you, they have there are still some classic measures like Arbitron that I think I'm not sure if Sirius still uses for their main shows, but uh, but definitely did. Um, and and you can kind of track things indirectly using seeing seeing how things are doing on social media. But there is mm -hmm. definitely less of a less of a focus on metrics uh, that, compared to podcasting, uh, where you really can track your downloads in a lot in a lot of uh, in a lot of discrete detail. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Um, awesome, Ali. Do you think we can? Uh... We can try. Again. I don't know. You tell me. You tell me. Do oh. I sound better now? Yes, so much better. Thank you so good, much for good. helping us figure that no out. No worries. No um, worries. Uh, yeah, please go ahead and introduce yourself. So uh, maybe I should uh, I should restart then. Um, so I've been creating and hosting two podcasts in Farsi. Started from 2015. Um, both of them, at the core of them, they're pretty much the same. I read or listen to or watch something. And then I retell that story to my audience the way I would tell it at a dinner party, sort of. Um, when you have time and you're sitting down and you're relaxed and you have like an hour, an hour and a half, I have that of hopefully undistracted attention of yours. And then I can tell you that story um, patiently. So the first podcast, the Channel B, was mostly like nonfiction writing of all different sorts from essays and to profiles, but mostly more and more I get into like true crime and both it appealed more to, to, to audience and then I grew an interest in that all of a sudden. And so it became more a true crime-ish show. And the second one, B Plus, was from the beginning dedicated to me summarizing and... Um, maybe also like give, 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 giving my angle to every nonfiction book that I read. And I feel like I'd like to share this with my friends. So that's my way of doing that. Um, so I read the book, I take my notes, and then I give you the gist of the book, the summary of the book, actions that could help me. And th those are like different types of book too. So it's from, it's from personal development all the way to history and pretty much everything in between. So I started with that 20, uh, yeah, the, the channel B 2015, B plus 20 series 17, and uh, they are both uh, going on. Awesome. Uh, that's super interesting about like the, I think your pitch is retelling stories as if you're at a dinner party. And I, I feel like at dinner party, people definitely kind of share their opinions as well. And it's not just like summarizing, right? Do you do that as well and kind of, in what way do you share your opinions 
you know, not knowing exactly who's listening compared to when you were at a dinner party. Very good point. In a very controlled way, I do. Uh, first of all, I'm like very upfront that, okay, so far what I've said was writer's opinion. This is my take on it. Mm. And I repeat that like in the beginning and at the end, okay, this piece that I just said, this was my opinion and my opinion only. And every time I do that, of course, there is some backlash. And then uh, that's, that's, uh, that's something you, get, you, you, need, you need to learn to how to cope with, but uh, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the deal. Super interesting. So Zara told me that um, you are both a host and a producer for both of your show. And I think Josh mentioned, mentioned like some really interesting aspect of producing, meaning you have to track your metrics, kind of see a lot of these things that you can see firsthand that you couldn't see on the radio before. Are you engaged in that process of producing too? Or which part of, besides you know, hosting your own show, which part of the production are you most involved in? So in the production itself, it's practically, I do that, uh, the, the, the writing myself. So the, con the, the material, I've, I, I write it myself mm -hmm. uh, in, in one of the shows. In the second show, no, I have a co-author co uh, with me, helping me, he'll, helping summarizing the books. Mm -hmm. But also I'm the one diving not that deep to be honest but diving the deepest at least amongst our team into the statistics and analytics of of mm -hmm. the podcast to the extent that it's provided by uh, podcast hosting platforms which is not really that deep anyway if you compare it with what you get from google analytics for example or or what you get from youtube for instance what you get from podcast it's like uh, pretty pretty old it's like pretty superficial too that's a super relevant point, and I'm definitely biased here because I work on Insights of Spotify, uh, even though not on the creator side. I'm just so curious, and Josh, I would like to ask you the same question. Um, which part of analytics do you feel like you need the most that the platforms are not providing to you? Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, it's really true that the, the state of podcast metrics currently are uh, compared to what you can see for, I think, YouTube or a lot of other systems are, are, are not nearly as, uh, not nearly as in-depth. Um, really, really the most useful to me uh, as, a, as a producer is just sort of seeing, you know, how episodes perform in contrast to each other. Um, and, I, and I imagine that there's ways you could go, you know, I know that Apple's introduced some tools that like you can, for instance, see where people are, are dropping off during an episode, uh, which, which, which can be useful, but, um, but honestly, in, in day to day, I'm not, I don't find myself missing much and maybe, and maybe it's just because my imagination hasn't been opened yet. to like what, what analytics could really be there. But a lot mm -hmm. of, a lot of the work I do is, is, is the, kind of that episode level data is usually good enough to sort of uh, mm -hmm. see what topics are resonating with audiences, what guests uh, seem like they're bringing in the biggest audiences. That's, that's the most important thing. It's tough to be. Mm -hmm. What about you, Ali? No, I'm, I agree, actually. I agree with Josh. I, even though it's not that deep, I don't mind it not being that deep, neither. I'm, I'm, I've started with, uh, with YouTube, experiencing with YouTube a few months from uh, January, actually. So it's been, it's been a few months now. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I get a lot of analytics there. And uh, I mean, there is, there is no limit. There, there you can actually dive in and not come up for like two or three days just read just to study youtube analytics forever and there is of course there is the, the more the, the deeper you dive you, the more you learn there but there, there isn't there's is a limit to how useful it is actually mm -hmm. and uh, how much as a creator uh, how much do you really want to know <laughs> so because the, the, there is some point there too like you said all right i, I don't really First of, I mean, above everything, and f first of all, I'm creating this host, this this show to enjoy it. Uh, mm -hmm. If if you tell me a bit too much on how specific, how every specific target group of my audiences are behaving and reacting, and the retention of this segment of the the show, and that may be a bit too much. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. So that's that's something I say it's not deep, but I don't mind it actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really I really agree with that, and I think there's there are, uh, for creators I think it can be a really big mistake to try to optimize your content too much right. toward what is what is hitting those metrics. 
Um, like you really, you, it's really important to have have a voice and be chasing the topics you're passionate about, and and audiences will follow you there more than saying like, oh, how can we hit whatever whatever X trending topic is or or whatever. That's a that's a that's a route to just make make whatever you're doing just less less uh, less interesting, more generic, mm -hmm. and less authentic too. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, since we just talking about audience, we, I did have a question that I wanted to ask you from the beginning, which is, it sounds like having an authentic voice, having your own point of view, while being mindful of, you know, what tracks with a popular audience. Um, how else do you grow your audience besides, you know, like developing that distinguished, unique voice for yourself? Yeah, I, I can go first on that one. Um, so for us, uh, when I started in 2015, there mm -hmm. were not more than, there were less, obviously, I think not, not more than five, six podcasts in Farsi anyway. So there was nobody there, practically speaking. And if you listen to the podcast from episode one, still we do that. But the, the, the earliest episodes, I'm repeating it like in the intro, in the outro, guys, this is the podcatcher app. That's why it's good to, to listen to podcasts on the, these applications as opposed to like downloading mm -hmm. the MP3 file. So I'm doing podcast 101 to my listeners in 2015. Um, and I had to do, I still, we still have to do that to, to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, so growing was, so this has basically, this has, this had its own uh, costs too, but it wasn't without benefits neither because a lot of, good stuff that people attribute to podcasts, V, I ended up taking credits for those too. Okay, this channel V is a good thing because you can listen to it while you're driving. Well, that's not specific for channel B, but people didn't know any other <laughs> podcast anyway. So that ended up, that, that, that uh, helped us to, to, to some extent too. But that was, the, so the, the growth was uh, purely organic. Uh, we still haven't, uh, come to the point that we feel like we need to invest or spend on advert paid advertisement we are still growing organic to some extent mm -hmm. i say to some extent because we are being like active on social media uh, on on instagram we are super active there mm -hmm. we are somewhat active on twitter and uh, we are hyperactive on our website as well, getting a lot of traffic research, traffic, uh, search traffic, um, mm -hmm. and then converting them to audience. So this is like an indirect journey, mm -hmm. um, not that cost beneficial, but um, not, not that bad. It, it is performing quite okay for us. And honestly, we don't really have that many other options, given all the, 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 um, the limitations we have. But so far, so to so, so, so long story short, uh, no paid advertisement so far for us, mm -hmm. uh, only organic. But then we gear that up with um, highly active, being highly active on uh, Instagram and, and on our websites. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the issue of discovery is really that, or, and like having, getting the audiences to find new shows when at a, at a network where we're launching a lot of new shows is really like the question. Um, and, and probably the hottest take I'll have on a panel that is about podcast recommendations is that in, in a lot of ways, especially for the kind of shows Earwolf makes, it's more of, it's more of a prop discovery is more of a problem for creators than it is for listeners in the sense that I think the average podcast listener uh, has a rotation that's pretty set um, when it comes to things like, you know, 52 episode a week chat shows. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you're a fan of seasonal shows, you know, serial style shows, that might be one thing. Um, and especially if you're a new podcast listener, I think podcast recommendations make a really big difference. But for, for, the, average, for the average podcast fan, you kind of have your rotation. Um, I know I have my rotation of like, this is this, these are like the handful of shows I, I check out every week. And it's a really high bar for something new to crack it. Um, and it's a really high bar for anything that we create, uh, even, even amongst like fans of the stuff we already make, uh, to, to, to crack into somebody's regular listing. Uh, so I still find that the best, re the best recommend the best path we have to growth is, is those really, really organic outlets, you know, obviously mm -hmm. you're sure we do things like paid advertising and, and 
a lot of a lot of the of those traditional tactics. But uh, at, with hosts asking listeners to recommend their shows um, and 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 uh, and tell their friends and and especially having guests on or guesting at other shows, you know, the, these these are still I think the very best route to bringing in a new audience is uh, having bringing like an individual person's audience into your show by inviting them as a guest or or kind of or kind of having having that exchange and and feeling like there's there's communities merging because being able to build that community in an organic way and, and something that feels like a word of mouth kind of buzzy way is still the 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 strongest route possible to having an audience that's actually gonna wanna wanna have it break into the rotation and have it stick week after week. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, we have I have we haven't found anything better yet at Earwolf, I think at least. Gotcha. Um, so it sounds like both of you converged on the idea that organic growth seems to be the best path for you. Um, but we also talked about metrics before, right? So what do you use those metrics for if not for audience growth? Or maybe you do and that's kind of like a facilitator for organic growth. I would just love to hear more about how you use like metrics and audience growth. Absolutely. So I mean, we uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take I'll take it first on this one, just because uh, we definitely have um, we we pay we pay pretty close attention to our metrics, and certainly, obviously, they're uh, they're really important for things like uh, tracking revenue and all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. But in terms of trying to trying to measure growth, we. Certainly, we run marketing campaigns on a semi-regular basis. You know, we'll mm. do things like paid spend or try, or attempt to drop, you know, have drop clips of episodes into other podcast feeds or do similar similar methods like this. Once again, kind of kind of depending on that sort of that even in the feed drop, you're kind of depending on that host recommendation aspect. But then it, we use those metrics afterwards to sort of see how did each of these individual campaigns perform. Uh, I know that's really useful to our marketing team. Uh, as a producer myself, um, it's most useful just in terms of like seeing what types of content are hitting with audiences. Um, which is like I, you know, I work on Unspooled, which is a movie show, which is probably the easiest easiest example because we can each episode covers a different movie, so we can mm -hmm. take a look and say, hey, we're covering big blockbusters this month, uh, and it brings in X audiences, and now we're doing something that's more like cult films or foreign films, and maybe that's going to bring in how much we predict it'll bring in probably a smaller audience because there's less name recognition, but how much less audience is it going to bring in? Uh, mm -hmm. We can test these things. And again, we don't want to optimize too much for that because a huge part of the voice of that show is like, we're not just going to cover Marvel movies. We're trying to have a really interesting diverse palette of shows, but mm -hmm. finding out how far we can go in that direction without really losing our core audience, uh, mm -hmm. that's really, really useful for that. Awesome. Thank you. Ali, what about you? Yeah, what I can add to that uh, is the, the, the metric we get from this um, Apple uh, Podcast Connect, the beta version of that from Apple, which is retention. And it's it's not um, based, I think, as, as far as I know, this is only like representing the listeners who are listening through this um, uh, podcast application on iOS. So it's pretty limited, but it's, it's it, you can assume with some, uh, you can assume that this is representative of your audience to some extent. And that could help us, okay, this is the point people actually leaving the podcast. And if the drop is like larger and larger than something, mm -hmm. then we can, we can learn some serious lessons there. Okay, this is what we did there. That's wrong. That doesn't mm -hmm. resonate well. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly like if things go really wrong, we can read it from the statistic. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing for our, uh, generally for our statistics, it doesn't really fluctuate much. It's, it's been a continuous growth from 2015 till now. Um, the, so, so like for us, it, you can't really learn much from that. You can like, okay, this is, I'm growing faster and I'm growing slower, slower. But uh, beyond that, there isn't really much more that I can expect from my, my statistics. Mm -hmm. I can see, okay, this is the, the platform they listen to. This is like the, uh, this is sort of the demography. This is the application they use that could change from year to year. But uh, apart from that, not really much, but this retention, mm -hmm. uh, I think that what, what Apple calls it is uh, consumption rate something along those lines mm -hmm. that helps me that is where i say all right okay this placing the ads there was not a wise choice probably 
people mm. are actually dropping there and not coming back. Mm -hmm. Or this intro was smart because it is engaging the audience from the very beginning. So they are not, nobody is leaving. Very few are leaving the show. All right, that's good. Mm -hmm. So th this kind is this kind of like learning. That's what I get from uh, Podcast Connect. Gotcha. I hope I'm I'm saying the name right. It is it is Podcast Connect, isn't it? Yes. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um. So with regards to audience, I uh without being able to see your metrics, I assume that you have a very diverse audience in terms of taste but also markets and culture uh that kind of stuff especially for for you ali you know like i think zara told me that you are the biggest podcast in farsi so do you encounter any sort of challenges when you have such a diverse audience maybe you know in terms of maybe they're bilingual they speak both english and farsi or english and other languages they come from different walks of life um i know at least for us spotify we focus on a lot on uh, the U.S. in the past few years, but we also know that, you know, podcasts, maybe not called so, uh, just another form of audio storytelling is growing in internationally too. So um, have you felt that or have you like have to had to deal with that kind of challenge? Uh, what can you share with us about that? Yeah, it, it is a challenge. I mean, creating content in any language other than English and also with any alphabet other than the like that, that's difficult because mm. many of the systems don't work that well like the hashtag system doesn't work that well with any language other than English and we can like use tags on uh, English tags on our post but then they could look like this you know this is the, the content is not English you're using English tags maybe you're doing something fishy there so that that itself becomes all right. Do I really have to do that? How do I how do I really get 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 myself into like Explorer, for instance, <laughs> without without using the hashtags? And if I use the hashtag, that could be turned. So that that's a, that's a challenge. But uh, as I said, creating content in in Farsi, um, it's it's not it hasn't been really easy. Uh, discovery is 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 a challenge anyway. But what I'd like to see is, all right, if somebody is consuming any Farsi content on this platform, would it be possible for this platform to offer them more of Farsi content? Mm -hmm. And when I say content, it doesn't necessarily have to be podcast. They are listening to Farsi music. Could the platform offer them Farsi music? They are reading a Farsi book. They are like browsing mm -hmm. Farsi websites. Could they be exposed to... Could my content, could podcast content, uh, Farsi podcast content be like brought in, in uh, be before them as well? Because without those helps, it's uh, it's tough. They mm -hmm. are like my our, our uh, audience, they are like all over the world. So based on the region, they are getting recommendations. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting, I'm, I'm in Netherlands. I use, I, I listen to Farsi podcasts. None of my recommended podcasts in my feed are, are uh, Farsi. Mm -hmm. everything is in dutch i mean norway everything is is in norwegian because it's based on my region different depends on the the application you're using obviously but this is not really that that uh, that well developed i feel mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. yeah uh i i that's uh, re really fascinating from ali and the only thing i'll add to it is uh i know i mean earwolf shows certainly mostly focus as Stitcher shows generally mostly focus on the American audience and the English speaking audience. But we have, we do see that like shows shows around the world in different languages are growing and we have tried to tap into that. I know we've created, we worked on a show, uh, had, we're producing a show called Spanish Aki Presents that was specifically uh, a group of uh, bilingual comedians who spoke both Spanish and English and we're planning on producing some of their episodes in Spanish. Um, and was a really amazing, uh, a really terrific show, but a show that even when we were, particularly when we were experimenting with things like releasing full episodes in Spanish or trying to find that Spanish speaking audience, it was just really difficult to connect with them. Um, we had a really hard time finding finding that audience, which we know exists and w would love the content, but uh, I think would have a hard time searching for us. Mm -hmm. This is a great point. Um, I want to just remind the audience, especially those who just joined, that you can put your questions in the chat and I'll make sure to read them uh, when we take pauses between topics. 
Um, but I just want to say that both of you, I, I feel like you have done your user research very well because these are things that we have heard from our users as well. You know, the discovering contents and language that they're familiar with uh, is hard. Um, or even, you know, just like you said earlier, like people have a rotation of podcasts and they're very limited in time to be able to squeeze in another one. So podcast discovery is, is hard for the user too, and especially for creators because it's a, it's a very competitive crowded space. Um, okay, so yes, please audience, please feel free to put in your questions. Um, and next topic, uh, since we were talking about discovery, uh, language is an obvious issue. Finding audience in a new language or maybe new culture is an issue. Um, so it seems like as a platform, uh, platform, people who work on platforms should think about these more. Is there anything else that you think could help? Uh, maybe in terms of data or any kind of process with creators that platforms can work on to help potential listeners find your specific podcast? Oh, uh, I'll, I'll share a couple of ideas that have come to mind, which is um, things that we've experimented with, even like within like our own specific Earwolf site, but I'd love to see implemented in a bigger way in, in, a, in a dream world. One of them is, uh, is being, able to, being able to search by, by, by guest or by talent, which is, mm. you know, a huge, again, like, like I emphasized earlier, a huge way that people discover our shows or that our audience finds new shows is from uh, hosts of that show, uh, guesting at other people's shows and vice versa. And the way that that talent is sort of shared uh, between episodes. And so if I say, I, if, if I'm a big fan of the comedian Paul F. Tompkins and I wanna find out every episode of a show Paul has been on uh, as a way to, because that's often a great entry point into new shows is if Paul's on an episode, it's probably gonna be a good episode. Um, mm -hmm. The ability to search for talent to say, see both the shows he's hosted and the shows he's guested on uh, would be a really terrific route for, for discovery that I know I, I think a lot of what, you know, we have that ability on our website to search by guests, but being able to implement that in an app would be huge. Um, mm -hmm. Another another idea I've, I've talked about just and maybe it's because I come from the radio world uh, and I I think it's an amazing tool that sort of just helps cut down on that whole, on just the decision fatigue of being uh, confronted with so many different possible shows um, is having some kind of good like one button option if you're a fan of like a genre or a network uh, say if you if you are like uh, if you're a comedy fan or even if you are a fan of earwolf shows but you're like I don't know which which show from this network I want to put on I can't think about it I have to start my commute in the next two minutes and I have no time to figure this out uh, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna hit like the Earwolf radio station or plus pre press play on the Earwolf channel and it will immediately float like uh, something that I know I something that I know is going to be from that world and as a possible tool for, for discovery, uh, mm -hmm. where I don't have to investigate too hard or think too hard. I can press play and I know I'll get something I kind of like, which doubles for your creators as a tool for, I think, discovery for fans of that audience. Yeah. What about you, Ali? Yeah, that would uh, just just one thing to, to add to what uh, Josh just said. That would just make it more difficult for indie podcasters to get audience if audience have the chance to play all the shows from Airwolf. <laughs> let's say that it's probably, all bundled. That's probably true. <laughs> it is. Uh, I mean, but but also options of things like um, a say. It, it could be something like a, a, a comedy channel or a yeah. or even like an or an independent shows channel a way to say like if you like if you like this style or if you want to hear what's up and coming you can press play and you can hear something that's that's cool um maybe something that's even been selected by like a uh, a like I, I think having something something that like old djs on radio shows that would mm. float records used to like the role they used to play of tastemaker uh, somebody who could be like i really i'm hearing the hot new shows that are coming up uh, this is something that I think you, if you're a fan of this show, you're really going to love this, but having that kind of human recommendation of like, Hey, check this new thing out would be, would be really huge. No, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think in general, we are not, we as producers of podcasts, we are not really feeding the system with that much of metadata for each single episode. So there is some metadata on the show itself, some general description. There is uh, there is the, the the show notes too, which apps uh, some of them use them, some of them don't use them at, at all. 
but for the single episodes, because going back to what Josh just said, if you if you're like if you're after some inspiration for for a dinner recipe and you're after like a 20 minute long podcast on on cooking uh, vegetarian you should be able to somehow search for it not not really narrow down that much but still i would like to see that option that as a creator when i'm uploading an episode i'll tell a bit more about that episode some more metadata would be helpful down the line down the line anyway but I'm, we are not doing really that much of that. We just upload the file, a very general uh, description, and that's it. So obviously, it won't be searchable. There, there is no, there is no, no metadata to go back to, and mm-hmm. that's um, that's something I, I honestly, I expect that to come to, to come anytime soon, like sooner or later. Mm-hmm. But that would that would help a lot uh, because then you can then it actually can help us. That is that is the kind of data that I can take uh, take a good look at and realize, okay, this is the category of, of content that my audience is relating to most. Mm-hmm. That could help me. Uh, but the way it is now, I can't really get that much from it. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like uh, more metadata that producers can provide to the platform, especially, you know, like Josh said, like guests or talents um, by episodes, just make it an easy entry point for people, but many more like topics or any kind of features of the episodes that you think will be relevant should be, should be used by the platform. Exactly. Like to give you an ex- example, the, the, uh, the platform I was hosting my podcast on for three years, um, on the show metadata, the, the, uh, the Farsi language was not one of the options. So I couldn't mm. even tell the, uh, the, the platform that this content is in Farsi. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine how, how hard it will be for audience to discover. It's, it's practically undiscoverable. Right, yeah. Uh, but, and and now, now Farsi is there, but still like it's at show level. It's not at episode level that we're, we're uh, communicating that information, that what is this episode actually about? Who is this good for? Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. So we do, have, um, we do have like a set of questions, like I said, that we asked uh, the folks that who couldn't be here. So I'll just, I'll just uh, convey to you all what the questions are so you can contextualize the answer. So first we'll to switch a little bit, switch gears a little bit to see the answers. And then, you know, we'll come back to this live discussion panel. Um, and I'll try to save maybe like 10, 15 minutes at the end. So if anyone in the audience, if you want to just, you know, turn on your microphone or video to ask the panel questions directly as if we were there in person, uh, please feel free to do so. But of course, you know, if, if you feel more inclined to put in the chat, uh, please also do so. Okay, so um, this is a question that we asked the uh, other podcast producers and hosts. Um, what are you, so we asked, this is, the, this is a structure I actually usually use for my user research studies. Uh, so it's, it was interesting to see uh, from the creator side what you share. But uh, we asked about their fears, hopes, and dreams. So fears, uh, what are you worried about within the podcast recommendation system space? Uh, what do you fear might happen that's good for you, your audience? Uh, that's not good, sorry, not good for you, your audience, or the podcast world in general. And hopes here center around what you hope will happen, like it's more feasible in, in a near term that will benefit you or your audience. And dreams is, you know, if you have a magic wand, what would you like to make happen in uh, the podcast recommendation systems? And it's just in general in the podcast world. Uh, and this is regardless of feasibility. Uh, so first, let me try to share my screen. So just one moment. Um, so we will first hear from Wendy. Um, so Wendy is a radio reporter and journalist and um, created the Gimplet podcast, Science Versus. 
Uh, and please let me know if you can hear the video and see it okay. All right, let's try to refresh route. We can't. see the yeah, we can't hear. Oh, you can't see it. I can see it, but I can't hear it. Try downloading the video. I'm sorry. What did you say? Uh, you can download the video and uh, play it locally. Oh, I see. Um. Um, I think it might have to do something with your voice coming from which tab. Um, I see. Is that, is it, would it be easier for you to share maybe? Um, I'll try. Let's see if that makes a difference. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so maybe while we wait for Zara to do that, we can go ahead and just talk to our live panel here. So Josh and Ellie, whoever want to start first, uh, what are your fears that you can share with us about the uh, podcast recommendation systems that you've had experience with so far or in the future also? Like what might happen that's not good for you or for your audience? Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, the, the big obvious fear here is just uh, the idea of a couple of like, I mean, that's that when people are searching for. So I shows. think my. Oh, I think I think that's working. Awesome. Um, OK, so maybe Zara, we can wait for Josh to finish and then we can play Wendy. Yes, I just wanted to try that. It. it works. Josh, please go ahead. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, th the big obvious fear for me here is just the idea that when people are searching for recommendations that there may be uh, like a, a handful of big shows that are crowding out the long tail of mid-tier and, and indie shows. Uh, you know, obviously, I think right now, I forget what this statistic is, but I think it is something like, uh, I don't know, 1% of podcasts get more than like 30 or 30,000 downloads an episode. I don't think that exact math is right, but it's something like that. We're like, even uh, like, the mid-tier podcasts are barely breaking like the 1% of like all of the podcasts that are out there. And already, uh, I think recommendation is, is highly geared towards like the big hits. But I, I, I worry about a situation where like, as, and some of this, you know, honestly, you can put on the shoulders of big networks like like Stitcher, where we are, we're creating huge shows of like celebrities and uh, which are obviously uh, flashy and easy to recommend because they're, they're from talent people know. But I do worry about, uh, you know, big big celebrity names crowding out like both existing mid tier shows and the ability of any new shows to gain traction. Oops, sorry, I just realized I muted myself. So I I was saying that uh, Josh, this theme um, I think really resonated with the other podcast hosts too. Uh, in terms of recommendation system being biased towards big hits and grouting out a long tail. And act actually, at least for Spotify, I know that it's a, it's a problem that we try to want to solve for creators. Um, but yeah, let's hear what Wendy has to say, because I think you, you might find it resonating. Oh, well, let me start again. Um, okay, so I think my biggest fears around recommender systems is that our show gets left behind uh, so that Science Versus doesn't get recommended to audiences that I think would like it um, and that similar sort of science shows instead get recommended. Um, that, that would kind of be the worst thing uh, that could happen. Um, in terms of uh, my hopes, uh, on the flip side, uh, my, my hopes is that our show does does get recommended to audiences who like it. Um, but more than that, and a little more nuanced, would be that um, we're not only getting recommended to people that listen to similar science shows, so people listening to theologies or Every Little Thing or something like that, uh, where a lot of those audiences might have already heard of Science Versus. But, you know, my hope is that 
we would be reaching out to people who might not have heard us, sort of shows that are like a little bit adjacent, but kind of feel similar. A show like You're Wrong About, for example, um, that, so that it's really trying to elevate science versus and kind of grow the show, basically. Oh, uh, it sounds like it's, uh, <laughs> it has passed. Um, so you stopped listening to, no, it was not paused. Okay, I think maybe my connection is not very good, but let me continue. Yeah, you guys you. know this as experts in the space. I think um, what sometimes I see, and this is more of a user experience rather than as a creator, is that sometimes I get recommended shows that I not only don't want to listen to, but despise. And then I feel weirdly emotional about it. I'm like, how dare you think I would like this trash? And so my dream would be that that never happens. Obviously, recommending science versus everyone would never elicit that response. Um, but my dream would be that a recommender system could get inside people's heads, not literally, uh, and, and basically give them something that they didn't even know they wanted. Um, which I think science versus kind of fits into because a lot of people think they don't like science and then they listen to the show and will say, oh, this was really fun and I learned a lot of really great things. So if a recommender system could somehow know who those audiences were who think they don't like science but want to know the facts um, and then would recommend the show to them, that would be my dream. That was Wendy's. Um... Whenever you want, I can play Patrick's as well. Let me know, Ni, what this yeah. time we continue. Uh, thanks. Let, uh, I think we can like switch back to our live panel for a bit before we play Patrick. Maybe Patrick can be our bookend. Um, but yeah, so Josh, as I said, like it seems like Wendy share the same fears and the hopes and dreams piece very closely related to kind of like the idea of recommending the right show to the right people. Uh, what about you, Ali? What 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 are your fears, hopes, and dreams? And Josh, I have not forgotten. I know you haven't shared your hopes and dreams yet, so let's get back to that too. But uh, I wanna I want Ali to get a chance to share his fears first. Yeah, interesting. Interestingly, I think it's mine is is a bit different. Um, uh, again, have you have had you asked me this question maybe a year back? I would have said, well, there is no fear whatever comes is good because I have my audience and on top of that you're going to help me get some more so what could go wrong there um, but now I've been working with YouTube for nine ten months and there is a lot of things that can go wrong there believe me because on YouTube you are getting depending de depend it depends on your channel obviously and um a lot of other things, but you're getting, we are getting more than 70%, 80, sometimes more than 85% of our viewership from YouTube recommendation. And uh, that's good to some extent because you say, well, I, I got this many viewers and then YouTube helped me get this much more. So good, all good, right? No, it's not because you're highly dependent on YouTube to recommend your content to the others. So you are not in charge, actually. You, you, you have to study those algorithms. Algorithms. Mm -hmm. You have to learn what you need to do for YouTube to recommend you to others. And it's pretty quickly becomes an obsession because those are the numbers you're working against. You mm -hmm. are work because whatever you do, you're not you're not responsible for more. You're not directly responsible for more than 15, 20 percent of your audience. Anyway, the majority of them, YouTube is giving you that audience with a recommendation system. Obviously, the second largest uh, search engine in the world. Right. So they are giving you that those audience. So you 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 start you have to in a way you have to start working for that algorithm. So you do whatever it takes for YouTube to recommend you to others. And that, not, that may not necessarily be the thing, the very thing that you started, to, you, you started the channel to do. Your core audience value most in your content. And it becomes, 
this is heavy. This is like a, this is a demanding job then trying mm-hmm. to satisfy that algorithm because this is, and to me it was new, probably like many people, maybe many in the audience here, they know this already, but I haven't worked with anything like recommendation based before. Mm-hmm. And now I realize, okay, there is something to fear here because if this recommendation system starts working and starts working well, it means that it's going to get my show in front of new audience. Then I get addicted to that. Then I need to satisfy that algorithm. <laughs> and then, mm-hmm. okay, I, this, is, this is not the same thing as creating content for people who love my content. Mm-hmm. It's total, it could be totally different. So I do have big fears there, actually, even though I know it could uh, help me, discoverability, obviously, as I explained l- the earlier. Mm-hmm. Again, what I would like to see is my show, any podcast, uh, Farsi podcast, wrote in front of anybody who's consuming Farsi content, listening to Farsi music. All right, now it's commute time. Maybe it's time for some Farsi podcasts. You're going for a run. All right, maybe it's time for some Farsi podcasts. Farsi, Farsi, because you have Farsi on your your, your phone, on your setting, whatever. Maybe, maybe. So the, of course, I, I, would, I would like to see that. But then I've had this experience with YouTube. So I'm a bit uh, fearful there too. To be mm-hmm. honest. So Rosie had a, asked, asked you a question in the chat, which is, uh, what do you see the algorithm encouraging to you to you to do that makes you, you know, like fear the addiction? Uh, on YouTube. Yeah. So of course, obviously, so you you have these metrics that you're working towards. There is the click through rate. There is the the retention, um, and you, so. You, how do you increase your click-through rates? Because obviously your performance in the first 24 hours, that's going to set the, st- the stage for your performance in the first week. And that is going to pave the way for the pure performance down the line. CTR, you keep, a look, look, you keep an eye on that. How does that work? And what is your CPU, you, what, um, what contributes in, in uh, the performance, your click-through rate? It's your title and it's your thumbnail. So these two, they don't have anything to do with the content of your video, right? Mm-hmm. The thumbnail is something different. But you have to learn what kind of thumbnail appeals to the type of audience you need to, 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 to get or you're, you're, you're targeting. If I compare it just here, if I compare this with podcasts, I don't, I don't care about my, my thumbnail, my, uh, what do you call it, um, cover art, my, my poster, episode, episode poster. You mm-hmm. don't really need to have that for every single episode. Some do, some don't. Some podcasters show that. Some podcasters even don't show that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a significant part of my production workflow because it doesn't really affect my show much. It's an artistic work. I would like it to to look good, but it doesn't really drive anything. But on YouTube, it does. So that's that's something. It doesn't, it's not, um, it differs, right? So it's a different thing to make a good thumbnail. To make a good title for your video is a different thing. It's a different skill. It requires a different skill set. Mm -hmm. so you need to add a new skill set to your toolbox which has nothing to do with creating good video creating with good good video requires good content good uh, videography good Mm -hmm. storytelling all that creating a good title that that's not part of that job but it now is for Mm -hmm. podcasts giving it a good episode title yeah to some extent but not really you have your subscribers you have earned it already you did the work you have you have you have convinced me now i have i'm a subscriber to your show so every time you drop an episode i'll get Mm it i'll see it in my feed you don't need to hustle more it's already there you've done your work now you can sit back and produce your content and i'll enjoy it Mm -hmm. in youtube it's it's there is no guarantee you have done your work i have subscribed and i've uh, clicked the bell Still, there is no guarantee that when you drop your next episode or next video, I'll, I'll even see it on my home screen. There is no guarantee there. Mm-hmm. A lot of other, thing, other things need to work 
for me to be able to see your content on my home screen. So that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, scary, actually. The recommendation system, if I, if I start imagining, okay, the same thing that's going to happen to podcast, that I need to learn a lot of other things that has nothing to do with creating podcast, creating content. I need to learn those and those are going to affect my, my listenership. It's not enough to get some to get somebody to subscribe to the podcast, but on top of that, I need to with every single episode, I need to go and and uh, convince them. I need to sell it to them every single time. Sell it to YouTube first, sell it mm -hmm. to the algorithm first, and then sell it to them. Um, that's a totally different game compared to what we have been playing so far in podcast. It's a it's a really well taken point, and thank you for articulating that because I think it is something I hadn't I hadn't I hadn't thought of much before. But I mean, it's it's almost it's almost a benefit of kind of a little bit of the lo-fi nature of podcasting is that you do you subscribe to a feed, you know exactly what you're getting in that feed, you see all of the content, you compare it to something like um I know I know this is a, a, something that had happened to Facebook for example, Facebook groups in 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 the news feed where uh, they all of a sudden started finding that posts that used to show up all the time uh, now only show up if it's hitting if it's hitting whatever the news feed algorithm is because the algorithms uh you know uh controlling uh, controlling the flow of all content and so the focus turns into how do you game the algorithm which does definitely really warp that content um it is it is that's for sure a concern if we go too far down that algorithmic pushing road mm -hmm. has any of you this is a question that comes from the chat too has any of you feel like you've been pushed to not just think about added skill sets right uh or maybe like polish your production when podcast is meant to be a lo-fi medium uh, but have you been kind of encouraged or pushed to change your content in any way i know that was a fear that we just articulated but also a concern not a concern but something that we discussed earlier in the panel where you feel like you want to maintain your creative voice to to meet expectations of your fan but also you know to to ensure that you go on a journey that as creators you, and producers you you intended on, but have have you found yourself in situations where you had had to change? Yeah, I mean, oh. echoing this echoing this entire line of discussion, I we doing that we do that a little bit in a low level, uh, just with the data that we have. You know, certainly uh, I'll use that movie show again as an example that over time we have uh, in, in 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 the effort to gain the widest audience possible, move towards uh, more recognizable films to cover. Um, and maybe maybe a little bit further away from things that would be really interesting to like an audience of, co of core film fans, but not as likely to pull in the casual fans where we really want to get our numbers up. Um, but I, th I think I'm, I think I feel lucky now that like we haven't had we haven't had to do a lot of that. And I and I can see that there's um, in, in, a, in a world where it, that is similar to like YouTube recommendations where you would could go so much farther down that road where you're really just trying to like, yeah, perfect, perfectly optimize that title um, and so like figure out exactly how to, you know, sort of sort of game the system, uh, which which ends up with just like, I think, really cookie cutter content that doesn't doesn't please audiences or creators. Mm -hmm. Ali? No, I, I can uh, I can say a bit a, a little things on on that too because first of all I think if that happens it's a more it has a more like implicit nature to it so I may easily come out and say no that has never happened to me but that process it's such an internal process sometimes that even if it happens you don't you you may not even notice it you don't know why you decided to this sub to to to, to to work on this subject and not the other one, uh, you may perfectly articulate that, no, this was based on this and that and that is the, the, the reasoning, while in fact, this is driven by some other factors. But personally speaking, that's one of the beauties of like working totally independently, no network, no boss, nobody. So we get to decide what we work on purely based on our interest. And even, even the, pod, the, the B plus podcast that we're like, Picking books, there is no, it's very hard to describe the category of books we are covering there because there is no single or even three, four, five category of books that you can, you can find that could define like blanket. These are the type of types of book we work with. No, it's basically nonfiction. Whatever nonfictions that I read and I feel like talking about it, I will do talk about it. So no. No, the, the, the short answer is no, 
But the bit longer answer is that it may have happened, but it's such an implicit process that I wouldn't have uh, probably noticed it anyway. Um, so I've been uh, reminded by the organizers that we are at time. Uh, thank you both so much for joining the live panel. I know there are a few more questions and I think the, organiza the organizers will help facilitate maybe getting that, those questions to you all and you can decide you know, how to answer them. Um, but for myself, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And um, this has been really fascinating. And as someone who comes from Spotify, but also hopefully this is helpful for other platforms. I hope that you know, we can continuously make improvements to our platform to help you find the right audience and promote promote in a way that protect and elevate your voice rather than making you change in a way that you don't want to. Um, and just to end the uh, the uh, panel, we would love to play. I mean, Zara, you can start sharing your screen if you'd like to play maybe a couple of answers on the fears and hopes piece uh, that Patrick shared with us um, just to wrap up the panel. But again, thank you both so much and uh, hope you have the rest of the I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. Thanks a lot. This was, uh, this was very nice and insightful. Okay, due to some time crunch, we're gonna play some parts of Patrick's interview, specifically just to recommend Pat, uh, to introduce Patrick. He is an editor, reporter, and creator of Subtitle and a few other shows. I'm gonna play uh, some parts of this interview. Well, I mean, it just thinking about my Could you hear that? Did you hear yes. anything? Okay. Yes, I heard. My podcast, which is, it's, I mean, it's sort of a niche podcast, which is what podcasts generally are. It's about language and, and people who speak them. And it just, it, it is, there's a very, very loyal core audience. And we obviously want to build on that. Um, and if, we can only do that if we have the help of recommendations, whether they're algorithmic or you know just from people, other listeners, or what have you. And the fear that I and you know all independent podcast producers have is that we will kind of get squeezed out. That that you know, in one way or another, the same recommendations that you see again and again of the big podcasts will just become even more consolidated, which I don't think is helpful to anyone really it's not helpful to me as a listener i want i want I, I, from recommendations i will always want to see new things pop up so i can try a new podcast and and just kind of that would my fear would be that that the algorithm or the algorithm just you know um just is biased towards those larger shows that we all all know about you mentioned a niche audience. What what do you know about your audience, and what sh should uh, we know about your audience? Uh, well, we know quite a few things about our audience just through uh, uh, surveying over the years, a couple of different surveys that we've done, um, also from uh, our, our podcast publisher uh, gives us various metrics. Um, we know about things like completion rate, how how uh, from Apple. Uh, how, that meaning how uh, far into a podcast somebody has listened, which is incredibly useful. Um, and that, that's actually what makes me say that we have a very loyal audience because our completion rate is, is, is strong. Um, it, we also know from emails, Twitter, what have you, but we would love to know more. And if the algorithm can help us know more, uh, that would be great. That brings me to hopes. What do you hope will happen in podcast recommendation systems in the near future that will benefit you or your audience? Well, I'm really hoping that uh, these uh, recommendations, that these automated recommendations will be biased somewhat in favor of independent podcasts, because those are really what has driven the industry to being what it is today. Uh, all of those hit podcasts of, you know, many of them started off as independents, and certainly the podcasters did. And, you know, tomorrow's hits are, are independents today. So I really hope that the, the there's, you know, there will be a real bias towards sort of discoverability of smaller uh, podcasts that are, you know, that, and I'm not talking about like 
two guys in a basement talking about hockey or something like that. I'm talking about, you know, quality podcasts. Um, and I, I should also add internationally, I, th I think um, here in the United States, uh, the, the recommendations are, are kind of a little too narrow in favor of American podcasts. Um, there's, there's a whole world out there. Um, so I, for that reason, I, you know, for all of those, I, I just hope, I hope that the, the recommendations are as broad as they possibly can be. Okay, uh, Ching, maybe you want to take it to wrap up the workshop, or maybe I yes. can. Yes, yes, I, I need to find the. So this is just to wrap up. Um, Thank you to all our speakers today, uh, the keynote and the papers and uh, the panel that was really incredible. I wish that we had another hour to go there, um, but I think we all learned a lot. I certainly learned a lot. And this is really pointing us in a good direction for you know, the, the next challenges in podcast recommendations. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we have a Google group, uh, it's called PodRex. If you'd like to continue the, the conversations here, uh, we can connect there. Um, I've also taken a note of some of the questions in the chat for the, for the panelists and uh, we'll send them to them if they have time. Um, we can try and post this on, on, that, um, on that group as well. So thanks everyone again. I hope you enjoy the rest of Rexis and um, yes, hope we'll talk to you all soon.